Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about a problem going on in the Florida Reef Tract called Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease. So today we'll be focusing on two papers, one titled Impacts of a Regional Multi-Year Multi-Species Coral Disease Outbreak in Southeast Florida, and the other titled Microbial Community Shifts Associated with the Ongoing Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease Outbreak on the Florida Reef Tract. We will be going over generally what the disease is, how it is being studied, and what they did, what they found, and things we do not know currently, along with current restoration efforts. Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease, or SCTLD, is a lethal disease that was first recorded in Florida in 2014. Infected colonies display multiple lesions and have a quick death. This disease has a high mortality rate for susceptible species and has a high prevalence among those susceptible species. This disease has also spread very quickly through the waters of Florida and has spread quickly in past years when it was seen in the Caribbean and other coral reef communities on the equator. It is theorized that this is a bacterial pathogen, maybe a secondary infection, but the true cause of this disease is still unknown. The Florida Reef Tract is the third largest burial reef in the world, and since 2014, SCTLD has quickly spread throughout the coral reef communities along the coast of Florida. It is generally referred to as the White Plague, this is not a specific disease name, it is a general way of classifying diseases based on appearances. The term white plague is a general term for this disease. It's an umbrella term for many other diseases that lead to a white appearance of the corals. For SCTLD, not all coral species are equally susceptible, but those that are susceptible have very high prevalence of the disease. This disease has affected over 20 species of coral in the Florida reef tract so far. Studies in the past have shown that thermal stress and anthropogenic factors contribute to the spread of the disease, such as nutrient runoff, sedimentation from coastal development, and general climate change warming the ocean temperatures are all factors that accelerate the spread of SCTLD. Along with this, hurricanes in Florida have also contributed to the spread of disease through the mixing of waters, potentially moving pathogens to previously uninfected areas. So the first paper was a five-year study on the outbreak in Florida, and coral surveys determined the percent tissue loss among coral communities and how recent the mortality was. This was done by assessing algal cover on coral because recent inflicted corals do not have this cover, but older deaths will develop this over time. At the site of the surveys, the water temp, the amount of bleaching, and the disease prevalence was measured. This first figure demonstrates the prevalence of bleaching in disease and how drastically it increases each year. All diseases increased, especially the White Syndrome, in the year 2016. As you can see, the percent bleaching increased significantly from 2012 to 2016, but more drastic was the increase of disease, especially White Syndrome. In 2014, when reports of White Syndrome were first breaking out, disease prevalence was at about 1.24%, and by 2016 it had jumped up to 3.29%. There was a massive jump from 2015 to 2016 in disease prevalence. As you can see, it jumped up more than two times the amount. Within these diseases pre found present, the White Syndrome was notably increased. From 2012, when it was practically non-existent, it jumped up in 2014 when reports started coming in, and as you can see, between 2015 and 2016, the prevalence of White Syndrome more than doubled. So this figure is focusing on the disease prevalence percentage over years, and this is in regards to non-white syndrome and white syndrome. And as you can see with the asterisk noting statistical significance, the year 2016 has been a great jump, especially for white syndrome disease where it went from 0 to 2.5 real quick. As you can see, there is a general trend of increase in the disease prevalence and in the average between the non-white and white syndrome diseases graph, the white syndrome diseases 
as you can see, is contributing more towards the jump in the 2016 as the non-white syndrome had a jump, but it wasn't as large, and the white syndrome had a significant difference. In this figure, nine of the affected species of coral are shown with the white lesions on them. Here we're able to see what the disease looks like on a coral reef. While previous graphs and figures showed us the disease prevalence of the area, this figure shows us the live tissue area average. As you can see from the graph, the live tissue area is relatively stable up until 2016, where there is a drop in live tissue area. If we take a look at the individual species, this further confirms our point that certain species are very prone to white syndrome, while others are more resilient. In the top left, you can see a species that was nearly eradicated by SCTLD, same in the bottom left. However, the species of coral seen on the far bottom right seems to have little to no impact from the SCTLD. To summarize the results, the disease prevalence more than doubled from the years 2015 to 2016, where um, in 2016, white syndrome was 2.6 times more prevalent than past years. In this study, they found 11 out of the 24 species seen on the Florida reef track were infected with the disease. And they found that stony coral density had an inverse relationship with disease prevalence, in which the density of corals decreased with the disease spread. Scientists say that this is one of the most disturbing events in Florida Reef Track history. This is a video showing the progression of SCTLD from Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. The video shows a 10-day progression of SCTLD on a colony of elliptical star coral harvested from a reef on the lower keys. As you can see, as time goes on, the spreading increases rapidly. This may be due to opportunistic bacteria. We will discuss this further later on in our other paper. Now that we've gained a basic understanding of what the Florida Reef Tract is going through right now, we want to examine another paper published in May 2019, about a year later from the last one, that further explores the possible microbial shifts occurring due to the stony coral tissue disease happening in the Florida reef. The second paper involves the first microbiological characterization of SCTLD in which it is a step toward identifying the potential pathogens contributing to SCTLD. In the study, they found that 22 of 45 coral species in the Florida reef track are affected by SCTLD, in which they collected coral mucus slash tissue samples from the infected coral communities and extracted the DNA genomes to understand which microbes are influencing the disease. Samples were collected at the lesions at the first row of healthy-looking polyps adjacent to the lesion and as far away as possible from the lesion in apparently healthy tissue. Researchers found five unique ASVs in their research. ASV stands for Amplicon Sequence Variants, and this is a term used to refer to individual DNA sequences recovered from a high-throughput marker gene analysis. This means that they found five unique pathogens present in previous disease outbreaks and common among coral tested in the current study. These sequences were classified as Flavobacterialis, Clostridialis, Rhodobacterialis, Alteromonadalis, and Vibrionalis, groups which have been consistently detected in coral diseases as well as in apparently healthy coral tissues. Healthy corals seem to have these resident bacteria in which they grow and are opportunistic when disease arises, or saprophytic. These bacteria are enriched with nutrients to grow on decaying material of the organism. These species are not unique to white syndrome disease. They have also been found present in black band disease. They believe that these microbes are a secondary pathogen due to their abundance in various diseases and are dispersed geographically. 
Coral microbiome diversity also increases with environmental stress such as climate change, water pollution, and overfishing, in which it is generally accompanied with the five sequences mentioned before. Although they found these similarities, the enrichment of disease-associated bacteria in the lesions of corals with SCTLD is not definitive proof that the pathogen is bacterial. However, disease progression in laboratory and field trials appears to slow or stop with the application of antibiotics, strongly suggesting that bacteria are involved with disease progression. Researchers in this study found that the highest prevalence of SCTLD coincided with coral bleaching, due to elevated sea temperatures. As pointed out in the last paper as well, elevated temperatures due to climate change does seem to be a key factor contributing to the quick spread and high mortality rate of this disease. To summarize what we've learned so far, the disease in the Florida reef tract is rapidly spreading. It could be because of a residential opportunistic or saprophytic bacteria acting as a secondary pathogen. We also know that warmer temperatures catalyze the spread of the disease by providing an ideal environment for the microbes to flourish. We also know that this disease is acting in an open system of the ocean. This means water can carry pathogens easily to new areas. That, along with the great diversity of coral microbiomes, makes it very difficult to pinpoint a true cause of the disease. We also know that anthropogenic stressors can contribute to the spread of the disease through weakening of the coral reefs, making them more susceptible to disease. These stressors include overfishing, warmer water temperatures due to climate change, sedimentation from coastal development, like dredging, and nutrient runoff. While we don't know exactly what the pathogen is, there is a theory that it is either a secondary pathogen or some kind of bacterial infection. Researchers are still working to identify the true cause of the disease. Now we are going to take a look at a quick video that shows one of the many restoration efforts going on in Florida. As you could see from the video, there is active restoration attempts going on in Florida. The Florida Reef Tract Rescue Project is a group that is working towards recovering from the disease. They send people out to scuba dive, chipping circles around the diseased area. They found that this slows the spread of the disease a little bit. They've also been taking samples of corals from unaffected areas to create a backup population in captivity. The challenge with this is making sure that they have enough diversity to sustain a natural environment that could be used to repopulate after the disease has run its course. Now we'd like to transition to a short little discussion about any ideas that you guys may have for restoration. So let's take a few minutes now to discuss any ideas or thoughts you guys have on coral restoration in the Florida Reef Tract. We can discuss ideas you have to slow or stop the spread of the disease or to mitigate the effects after the disease has been wiped out. No pressure, but the crisis in the Florida Reef Tract is all riding on you.